Twelve years after leaving Earth, Voyager started observing Neptune. Almost three months later, the spacecraft nearly touched its clouds. But before that, it took 50 images on a daily basis to slowly unearth for us that faraway world. In order for us to grasp this voyage in its entirety, first we have to place it in a wider context. According to the historian Stephen Pine, we have stepped into the third great age of discovery during our first walk through the planetary neighborhood. In less than 500 years, we came from this to this. Impressive, but how did we do that? Thousands of years have passed between the first vessels and the first voyage around the world, the Great Circumnavigation of the Earth by Ferdinand Magellan in 1519. At the turn of the 16th century, in barely three decades, the vast sea has been turned into a complex system of routes connecting the world. It was the start of global trade, cultural exchange, and many conflicts. In the first great age of discovery, we discovered the ocean not as an end of the world, but as a passage into a bigger one. During the height of the Age of Enlightenment in the 17th and 18th centuries, the explorers were given a new priority, science. As biology, geology, and astronomy progressed, we started to look at the world differently. Serious expeditions were no longer planned without scientists. In the second great age of discovery, we discovered the world through science. Since time immemorial, we knew of the five naked eye planets. Small Mercury, never far away from the sun in the sky. Bright Venus with a dark secret. Red Mars, a favorite of science fiction authors. Gigantic Jupiter, the king of the planets. And magnificent Saturn. With the invention of the telescope, we discovered just how big of a charmer it really is. And that was not the only thing we came across while looking through the eyepiece. In his search for binary stars, musician and astronomer William Herschel discovered a new planet, quite by chance. That planet was the first one discovered by the telescope and introduced to us as Uranus. By analyzing its orbit, astronomers discovered some irregularities, as if something was pulling and pushing it. But what could it be? Mathematician and astronomer Urbain Le Verrier was asking himself the same question. He wasn't the only one who shared this interest, but that's another story. Le Verrier mathematically predicted the current position of this yet undiscovered planet. He sent his calculations to Johann Gottfried Galle, 
an astronomer at the Berlin Observatory, and only a few hours after receiving Le Verrier's letter, Gala confirmed the existence of the new planet by directly observing it. That is how he came to know Neptune. At the beginning of the 19th century, during our search for the distant ice worlds, we have found one much closer to us. We've discovered Antarctica, a place where during the polar nights, the temperature can drop to nearly 100 degrees Celsius below zero. Without thorough planning and modern technology, this is a place we can visit only briefly. Maintaining a camp in this ice desert could be a lot like maintaining a colony on the moon or Mars. And conveniently so, because both Antarctica and the ocean abyss surrounding it are a prelude of our ventures to the final frontier. The space race started with the Cold War, a power play between the United States of America and the Soviet Union. The Soviets managed to launch the first artificial satellite into the Earth's orbit. A few years later came another first, the launch of the first human in space. That honor goes to the Soviet cosmonaut Yuri Gagarin. Next stop, the moon. The successful landing of the first human on the moon is a triumph of science, technology, and political will. But after only six missions, that political will dissipated, as did the big space ambitions of the two superpowers. The last man that jumped about on the moon did so only three years after the first giant leap for mankind. But curiosity is hard to harness. After the moon, our attention was drawn by other cosmic neighbors. In the shadow of human spaceflight, we used robotic spacecraft to visit neighboring planets. That is how we discovered that Venus is far less attractive under its shiny clouds than the name suggested. We found no visible traces of present or ancient civilizations on Mars. And it turns out that Mercury shares an uncanny resemblance to our moon. The voyage to the more remote planets is a harder task. In the spring of 1965, a young engineer named Gary Flandro noticed a particular alignment of the planets that occurs once every 175 years. It gave us the opportunity to visit all the gas giants of the solar system in a single flight. That is how the Voyager was born, that is, the Voyager twins. Two almost identical spacecrafts, one designated to fly by Jupiter and Saturn, while the other visits Jupiter, Saturn, Uranus, and Neptune.
Twelve years after leaving Earth, Voyager started observing Neptune. Almost three months later, the spacecraft will have nearly touched its clouds. We arrived here following a trail charted for us a century and a half ago by Le Verrier and Gala. One saw our farthest planetary destination as a set of numbers, an outcome of his calculations. The other, a practical astronomer, saw it as a dot of light through the telescope and thus confirmed the calculation. They charted Neptune, and it was us who arrived there and got to know it better. This is how dots and numbers become worlds. As Magellan sailed around the Earth, so we traveled through the solar system. It is a suitable epilogue to this phase of our great journey, a voyage to the planet that bears the name of the ancient Roman god of the sea. A world at the doorstep of an unexplored expanse. Now, with our curiosity, we are charting the courses our descendants will take. What worlds await them? <laughs>